Welcome back to the APSCC 2021 webinar series. I'm Christopher Slaughter, your MC for the series. Uh, we're delighted today to have UTELSAT presenting Satellite Networks as a Service, Flexible Solutions for Evolving High-End Connectivity Needs. Joining us today, Brad Grady from NSR is moderating the panel session uh, to discuss the subject. PJ Bellier of UTELSAT, Joe Appa from Access Networks, Thomas Vandendriesch from ST Engineering iDirect, and Enkeng Yi from Singtel. Uh, please enjoy the webinar. Good morning and welcome everybody. My name is Brad Grady. I'm a principal analyst at Northern Sky Research focused on mobility, government military markets, and I have the pleasure of being joined with some very great panelists here. Um, we're going to be talking about satellite networks as a service, their context around changing technology landscapes, um, some new kind of CapEx trends that are happening in in the ground segment and at space, and what this all means for service providers and ultimately end users. So I'll ask the panelists to kind of introduce themselves and give a quick little intro of what they think about this topic, and then we'll get into some, some really exciting Q&A session. PJ, why don't you start us off? Thanks, Brad. Uh, PJ Bellier, I spent uh, 20 years at Speedcast, which I left uh, a year and a half ago. I uh, took a year off and uh, joined uh, UTELSAT now almost six months ago, uh, managing the what we call the, the business line connectivity, which is uh, dealing with um, all our services targeting um, uh, B2B markets, connectivity services targeting B2B market, maritime, aviation, enterprise, cellular backhaul, uh, IoT, so a lot of uh, diverse markets. Um, and uh, we are uh, at UTELSAT uh, selling our services through uh, partners, uh, service providers, and we'll talk a lot about uh, this interaction and, and how this uh, value chain is evolving. So lo looking forward to, uh, to this discussion, and thank you for having me. Okay. Yeah, hello. Uh, thanks, Brad. Uh, my name is Joe, Joe Apper. Um, I've been, I think, now in the satellite communication industry for over 30 years, so feeling old. I've seen a lot of changes in, uh, in technology over that time. Um, spent quite a bit of time with um, various companies in Marsat for a number of years, uh, where I was really managing the Asia region at one point in time. Uh, Speedcast, working alongside uh, PJ here on the call, declaring that one. Um, focused on maritime again. Uh, now at Access, Access Networks um, Maritime, where we are focused predominantly on connectivity, but the whole solutions package that goes with that. Uh, I know that's going to be a topic for discussion coming up, so uh, I'll save that one there. Um, but yeah, looking forward to the call. I think there is a lot of change as an industry that we are going through. Um, but yet there to me seems like uh, a lot more to come, especially over the next few years with uh, new satellite operators moving into the space, contributing to that space. And so it'll be very interesting to see the changes that they're going to bring and the benefits to the industry. Thomas? Hey, uh, thanks, Brad. My name is Thomas. I'm the uh, President and Chief Commercial Officer of ST Engineering iDirect. I've never worked for Speedcast, um, <laughs> but I worked, obviously. Uh, <laughs> obviously you applied, worked. though. Didn't you apply, Thomas? No. <laughs> I was asked, no, let's not go. Um, but obviously we worked with Speedcast uh, many, many times uh, very, very well uh, together. Uh, I was also the CEO of uh, New Tech, right? Uh, before uh, it's, and, and during and after its acquisition by SD Engineering um, in 2019, um, both iDirect and New Tech uh, formed uh, a, a ground segment market leader, right? Uh, focused on multi-service and so multiple services, uh, most like the services that uh, Pierre-Jean just mentioned, the mobility, maritime, aero, any type of enterprise service, cellular backhaul, trunking, but also broadcast and media and consumer broadband. So, so the, 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 the bulk of what we know is the, uh, you know, the, the, some of the sweet spots, the moving sweet spots, and we can talk about how those move 
um, in the satellite industry from a, from a market positioning. And of course, being a ground segment uh, company, we, we focus on technology and, and integrating technologies, uh, whether it's you know, cloud and 5G and, and all these different things that, that will help us uh, move forward and capture more market. Uh, integrating and innovating on, on the technology side to it, but to the service of the satellite operators and the service providers. Oh, hello. I suppose my turn now. My name is King Gear. I've been in Singtel for about uh, 30 years. So I just started my second tour of my satellite posting in Singtel about four years ago. So I run the whole satellite division for Singtel and we offer services in both the over the land and sea as well as teleport services. Okay, cool. So I want to just kind of start with maybe at the, the end of the network, if we want to say that. Um, and that's really how end users are interacting with the value chain. Um, We'll, we'll leave the technology conversation to um, another block, but I really want to focus on what end users are getting from service providers and satellite operators and everything. Um, we're seeing the, a huge migration, I think, on the service provider layer um, from focused on providing connectivity to providing applications and that kind of revenue stream. So Joe, I don't know if you want to start us off here, but why do you think and why do you see service providers moving into that different level of service? Yeah, sure. Um, I, demand. I think there is a, a call for it from the customer. Um, I think that's how service providers got into this, is really um, answering the customer demands. Um, there was a time when it was very clear and there were distinct lines of engagement where satellite operators looked after satellites and uh, service providers sold equipment, hardware, and then airtime. And, and going back a number of years, everybody was kind of happy with that arrangement and that setup. Uh, the, the call for applications that have been moving in are really because, again, vessel operators are no longer just focused on, on purchasing connectivity. They want to see the package. They want to see flexible solutions, customized applications. And a lot of that driver is is cost savings, I would say. That's certainly in the mix. You know, how do I become more efficient? How do I reduce my costs? What applications can I introduce to help me do that? But not just cost. I mean, there are other benefits uh, we're seeing significantly over the last few years, a lot more attention being paid to uh, crew welfare and looking after the crew and enabling the crew. And, and you know, the last... The last uh, year and a half with COVID has, has paid testament to that. I think we've certainly seen an increase both at, on the land side and at sea of increased usage of uh, video conferencing, let's say. I mean, everybody knows what a Zoom call is and what a Teams call is now. Um, I think I joined both getting here. Um, but, uh, you know, certain that wasn't the case going back uh, a year and a half. And, and crew internet, um, in, or the provision of internet has become more prolific, I would say, in the last year and a half, because we've had crews stuck on vessels. Um, in some cases, you know, the rotation of crews has not been allowed to continue because of uh, COVID and restrictions and confining them on the vessels until ports would, uh, would accept them. So it was imperative to enable and to allow the crew uh, to use crew internet, to use video conferencing, to use their email and to give them access. I mean, that COVID is one example that was going on beforehand. I just think it's accelerated. The, the usage of that now has, has really increased. Yeah. Um, and, and also, you know, security, cybersecurity has been uh, a topic of increased um, need and requirements and discussion. You know, every, every company now seems to have a plan in place to be able to try and deal with cybersecurity and the threat of cyber cybersecurity. Maritime is no different. 
you know, Maritime has been doing that now for a number of years. The risks have just increased. Yeah. You know, we see more threats. We see more attacks. We see the, the hijacking of networks and the ransom requests that are going in. Um, it's not just Maritime. All industries are affected by this. But, you know, the risk to Maritime seems to be certainly very severe if, if it were to go wrong at sea. Yeah. So, again, that, another layer of applications that we're working on with the customers to help provide them with uh, with solutions there yeah. and pj you kind of have had a foot in both camps i guess um how do you see this equation developing between satellite operators you know developing these satellite networks as a service and service mm -hmm. providers having to strangle it you know walk yeah. that balance of what what am i now yeah well uh, the satellite operators are not really at this stage getting into uh, value-added services um, but if you look at this um, uh, journey into uh, applications and value-added services that service providers are going through uh, it's it's very clear it's not new it's been going on for some years but it's still very small when you look at the large service providers value-added services represent a few per percent of their overall uh, revenue. Um, so it's still very, very limited. But they're all, I think, conscious that it is a necessary uh, and a welcome uh, evolution. Demand is one driver, as, as Joe uh, mentioned it, but there are other, other drivers. Uh, clearly, differentiation. It's a very competitive market out there, uh, and it's a way to differentiate from other service providers by providing more applications, more value-added services, different ones that may better suit the needs of, uh, of your customers. Um, another driver, a second driver that I, I see, or a third one, if I include demand as, as the first one, is um, uh, growth, revenue growth. Um, when you look at, at the evolution of, of volume and price, Service providers are always facing this situation, very well known in the telecom world, not only in satellite. You are renewing a contract that was signed three years ago, five years ago. The, the price per megabit in the market is much lower than when you signed that contract. And the volume, the growth of bandwidth may or may not compensate that price reduction. So sometimes you're in a situation where the revenue with that customer goes down, Sometimes it's flat, sometimes it may increase, depending on how much more volume of, of bandwidth the, the, the customer wants. Yeah. Um, but certainly selling more value-added services will play a big role in ensuring that your revenue can, can grow. Uh, and the, and the, the last aspect I would mention is margin. Uh, bandwidth uh, has gotten uh, slowly but surely commoditized uh, mar as a result uh, the margin uh, has started to come down, I think relatively recently, but it, it has in a number of cases started to come down. Uh, Value-added services are in general services where service providers are enjoying healthy margins. And it's a, it's a way to, uh, to solidify your margin or even increase it and compensate the, the decline you may see in profitability on, on uh, pure connectivity services. Yeah, no, and I think we've seen that migration on the satellite operator side, going from the, the video centric business down to data and that kind of, um, you know, a bit of dilution and those kinds of things. Um, so I'm curious about the Singtel perspective. You want to? Well, uh, I, I look at it more from the standpoint that we cannot stop evolution. So it is just a matter of uh, technology evolution where we cannot go against the tide. Because I think the expectations of technology has changed. What we want and what we expect a plain pipe to do has changed dramatically over the past few years. Just look at us now on the screen itself. I think for us in the past, if we want to talk to each other, we would be maybe just 20 years ago, we'd be screaming at the top of our voices on the IDD line where you have a lot of echo because the satellite link was very poor. <laughs> uh, 
And then after that, we migrated to, you know, IDD, we went to uh, fiber, and then you have a much better connectivity. But then after that, from this evolution of just what we expect from technology, now coming back now is, do we just expect a plain pipe? We no longer expect a plain pipe. The connectivity is a given. Crystal clear connectivity is a given already. So now coming back to what can we do? What do we want from this pipe itself? So I think it's a, it's a very gray and it's getting gray now where, you know, last time, oh, you are just a satellite operator. You are just a teleport operator. You are just an equipment provider. Now is if you don't integrate things, or how would I say, move up the value chain to be with your customer's expectation. How would the customer troubleshoot? Is it because of the bandwidth issue or is it because of the applications? Because I mean, just opening up the applications or getting the applications, troubleshooting the applications, it is not as simple as in the past because, okay, look, it's just that fiber link. You know, you just plug in one end, plug out the other end. You have the firewalls, you have the you know cyber security, and then after that, on top of that, you keep adding so many things. So the expectations of our consumers or customers have all changed. So we have to simplify and make life easier, better for everybody. So I mean it just in, in a nutshell, it just comes back to evolution, revolution. So this is what the customer wants. I mean. Plain pipe is a given. It must be crystal clear. It must work. It's just what you put on top of the plain pipe. That is where the challenging question now, the million dollar question. What do the people really want? Yeah. I mean, hopefully it's a few more than a million dollars, right? I don't, I don't <laughs> know if we're all going to do this for a million bucks, right? <laughs> um, Thomas, I, I want to kind of bring you in. And you know, I think you, you sit in a key part and maybe an underappreciated part of the value chain. Um, you know, I, towards the very end. And it's what the customer actually sees of the satellite network, right? Like this is the, all I know of a satellite network is this box. It sits on my boat or in my, you know, teleport, et cetera. Um, so how do you see this equation developing? I think, you know, we all hear about cybersecurity and, you know, the network itself and the monitoring of the network and the management of the network is maybe an application in and amongst itself of getting better insights into what's going on and through that pipe. Um, how do you see this all developing? Well, well, Less and less, the consumer or even the enterprise user sees any equipment at all, right? They just see a service and uh, hopefully they don't see any boxes. Uh, I think, and, and I would agree that consumer and enterprise behavior dictate more or less everything in terms of direction, directional approach. You just uh, look at, you know, consumers can be on a cruise ship at Speedcast, uh, they could be behind the cellular tower, right? Uh, just on a mobile phone, but the cell tower may be connected by, by, by satellite. They could be on an airplane, they could be, in, they could be crew, um, and, and their consumer behavior kind of dictates what happens next, what we have to do in terms of service or what we have to do in terms of technology to support it. Uh, and, and similar things at the enterprise side, you know, enterprises are moving to, you know, SD-1 uh, software defined networks. Um, they're, they're, they're looking at, you know, compared to a couple of years ago where they were connecting to get internet access, they're now, you know, connecting to get cloud access. And the, the, the applications that we talk about on the enterprise level, they, they are typically not really on-premise anymore, but they're somewhere in the cloud. So, so they're basically looking for cloud access. And some of the applications are also, you know, bringing the cloud to them over a satellite network, which is a kind of cloud edge cloud compute, which then translates into technology requirements and the service requirements. So, so there's a lot to say about enterprise behavior and evolution that, that we're not stopping, but supporting uh, and, and um, and it moves at the same pace as a terrestrial connectivity world, right? So, so there, I think the the gap of time lag between satellite and and uh, evolution and and uh, telco uh, terrestrial evolution is um, not permitted anymore. So we have to move at the same pace, um, and and therefore support all of that enterprise and consumer behavior for sure. But the, I don't think they see any boxes. 
<laughs> yeah, if we all do our job right, they won't touch any of it, right? Um, but I think this is a great segue to talk about, um, you know, cloud is always a great catalyst to talking about these conversations of changing CapEx to OpEx and that, that you know, how do you recognize the cost centers of your business and where can you, you know, save money or, or switch money around? Um, so I want to focus a little bit more on you again, Thomas. Um, how do you see some of these things developing on, on the cost side? I mean, there's this balance, I think, between cost and capabilities and maybe the cost of a VSAT terminal in the maritime space has been a barrier or the cost of migrating to the next generation, you know, widget has been a barrier in some markets. Um, but how do you see those capabilities evolving relative to cost? Well, what we definitely see is that you do need on the, what we call the terminal side, which is, you know, uh, the, let's say the customer business end uh, yeah. mostly, there's a set of a portfolio, right? You, you can't build one mode and that kind of does everything from, you know, gigabits on a cruise ship to, you know, the, 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 the lowest cost consumer uh, terminal, or small, medium enterprise, ter or an IoT device, right? An IoT device, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, definitely a, a, a low bandwidth um, uh, device. So we need, you need to definitely need a portfolio. Uh, so that's that's what we uh, build our, our architecture around, is you need to be able to support a portfolio of, of terminals. And that portfolio doesn't become smaller with the introduction of uh, multi-orbit uh, kind of architecture when you say, okay, we need to do high, high dense uh, geo capabilities uh, over land or over, you know, uh, mobile routes, or, or we need to support Neo and Leo as well at the same time or not. And then those also bring different portfolio elements to, to the set of modems and terminals that you need. And then, and again, a terminal is you know, a modem plus maybe a, parabolic or two parabolics that track or you know a maritime antenna or a phased array flat mechanical for an arrow or or a state-of-the-art new phase array antenna for something else so so there's a there's a, a rather large portfolio uh, and it's not getting smaller um, in terms of what fits best this application right and that's where the cost optimization is and it's like, can't do one fits all and there's a cost optimization. What is for sure the case is that that cost is going down in terms of CapEx cost of terminal per, per megabit served, right? You know, uh, in terms of how much throughput can you get through a terminal and does it cost more or less of the same? That, that, that equation is definitely changing. Mm -hmm. um, the, next to that, there is still on the lowest cost side, there's a continuous, uh, I think discussion and evolution on, on how a low cost terminal, and again, a read also their phased array antenna technology um, can enable a certain or disable certain applications, right? It, can you get consumer internet out of a Leo constellation? Uh, therefore you would need yeah, uh, phased array antennas at low. And we know the um, current status of uh, let's say the SpaceX uh, yeah, no, so I mean that's a it, it, an interesting metric the the capex cost per megabit per second, which I think gets to PJ's point. And PJ, I want to kind of bring you in here too. Um, that that is getting compressed and getting lowered, and that we all hope that the volume overcomes the you know the price compression issues. Um, but I think Udalset did a, a really great announcement or an interesting announcement. Um, well, a couple of days from when we recorded this a couple of days ago um, for Udalsat Advanced, right? Um, this kind of managed service portfolio uh, stuff. So I, I wonder, PJ, can you talk us a little bit through what that means for service providers like uh, Axis and Singtel and, you know, kind of walk us through what the CapEx kind of things and, and OpEx oh. there are. Yeah, uh, uh, your, your uh, uh, reference to the cloud is, is very interesting uh, because what we're trying to do is or to achieve is a cloudification of satellite services. Okay. Um, and from that perspective, I try to uh, uh, take over to Utelsat my 20 years experience as a service provider and to think what would have I liked to find? What is a dream come true? What's the ideal uh, offering that a satellite operator could, could offer uh, to me as a service provider? And um, you know, if you 
continue that that uh, parallel with with the cloud enterprises used to build racks and small data centers or big data centers at their locations then they said oh we're going to put those racks and those servers in, in in a data center somewhere else and today they're buying processing power applications just what they need um, in the satellite sector very similar service providers have been buying hubs building teleports and leasing satellite capacity significant capex to do this um, what we are trying to achieve with utelsat advance is to tell them you don't have to spend capex on the network we're going to deliver to you a service that is extremely flexible and that you can use as and when you need it and you can focus your investments your capex on where it really matters. And that was, that's what uh, Kenji was talking about. Where it really matters, where you can really create value for your customer and differentiate, which is the value added services. Um, and what's happening at the remote side. So spend your money where you can differentiate and create value, R&D on applications, et cetera, et cetera. And save on the CapEx on the network, Use our service as and when you need it. And a key um, element in Utilsat Advance and a change of paradigm is we're walking away from what has been the tradition in the satellite sector, or you need to commit long term, it needs to be three years, and you need to commit volume and etc. No. You come and go, you use the service as you need. That's what we we mean by cloudification. You really use it as you need, and you don't have a, a big startup capex. So that's what we are we are um, we're doing with with Advance, and we are um, we're very excited uh, about it. And in that, we're also making it very clear where we start and where we stop. We're not getting involved with value added services. That's where our partners can really make a difference and create value for themselves and for us, because the more they create value for their customers and for themselves, the more uh, bandwidth uh, and pipe uh, they will need. So we're leaving a lot of room for uh, service providers to really uh, create value on, uh, on value-added on, on value services applications at the application layer. Joe, Kenji, I guess your thoughts. I, I, I'm, I'm along with uh, what everything has been said uh, because I think for CapEx, OpEx, it all comes back to my earlier point, evolution, revolution, or whatever you call it. I think people are expecting to do, be able to do more and they, ex they want to do more and they want to pay less. So now is the challenge of paying less also then is you probably you have to like all what the cloud is all about like you share the infrastructure you share network and you have to share everything also because increasingly it is uh getting more challenging to do and manage your own dedicated network point to point and, and, and stuff like that because especially with all these cyber needs there are pros and cons when you have outsourced to you know you have no control over your own network versus you should have control over the network so it's a trade-off between control as well as cost, as well as what you expect and want and demand your network to be able to deliver for you. At a high level, it's the most important thing is lower cost. Mm -hmm. So yes, technology will change things. We are able to you know, miniaturize things and we're able to be more efficient and produce things uh, cheaper, better, faster. But there will be always be some limits in certain things. For example, let's say in the maritime industry, there will also be a point or there is some limitation because the land antenna versus the sea antenna. The sea antenna, you definitely, you need a gyro, you need a two axis or three axis, you need a radom. So to protect the and all these delicate uh, components against the elements, the seawater is highly corrosive. So, 
all these will evolve, but over the years, actually, yes, the prices have come down, but I think what is the expectation also between land and sea, there are certain differentiation. Mm. So once we cross all this expectation and differentiation, then we go down to how can we revolutionize or evolve connectivity at the sea even better. So I think that is going to be a, it is not say it's impossible, it can be done and will be done, but on the other hand, also limitation factors of the market size also. I mean, if you are a mobile phone developer, you are developing equipment where your market size can be few hundred million. Where, okay, if you have resaturation, everybody can be having a two phones or three phones, so your market can continue to grow. Yeah. The number of ships which are ocean going are actually quite finite. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so I think it's going to be a big challenge now is, okay, look, you have only one connectivity. Will every ship have two connectivity? That means, okay, look, maybe you have a service provider A, you have service provider B. Will, will we ever see a day where maritime connectivity is above 100%? So yeah. all these are challenging. So the, all these are economics challenges which we all have to look into because the maritime market realistically is actually quite finite in that sense. Yeah, well, I want to... saying it will not happen. It will happen because we will actually make all this uh, development to bring down costs as economies, the scales or mass production and, and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to kind of drill down a little bit on the maritime market is not finite in that it's also not monolithic. Um, I think people like to call the maritime market and they think it's the maritime market. But a cruise ship is very different than what a merchant vessel versus a fishing vessel versus a leisure vessel is. Precisely. And, you know, to Thomas's point, the scale of the technology solution needs to scale according to those needs. Um, and, you know, PJ is right there with that point as well. So, Joe, um, you know, I want to focus on you and PJ, please feel free or everyone kind of jump in on this. Um, how do we build those scalable solutions to kind of amortize costs over the largest possible kind of network possible, but still be able to meet the expectations of end users? I think sometimes that's a really hard challenge to solve. Yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, I, I did want to add just just on the comments already made, you know, yeah, in, absolutely. What I've, what I've seen and what I've experienced over the last few years in the maritime industry has has certainly changed. Um, and but one thing is true, the demand and the need for more bandwidth has, has been a big cry. We've seen a number of customers that have wanted to do more, get more bandwidth, do more with it operationally and, and for the crew. You know, I think anybody coming out of a contract and going into a new one is, as, as the comment has been made, um, looking to spend less. But I would argue I've seen many examples where they look to spend the same. They've got a budget, but there's an expectation that what they spent last year, they'll spend again this year, but they want more bandwidth. They want more services and yeah. they've got more ideas. Now, there's a better understanding and they certainly have more detail about what it is they, they want to spend this money on in which areas, whether it's to do with operational use of the vessel or again, retaining crew with a crew welfare and offering free internet, that kind of thing we see being quite common. So we do see this thirst for more bandwidth. And that is a challenge, I would say, to the, the, the maritime satellite operators. Um, and, and some have stepped forward and provided us with more and more uh, bandwidth, more uh, satellites, uh, more transponders, more megahertz. But, you know, there's always more that is being requested. You can look at some areas of the world, certainly in Asia, and you can see that some specific hotspots occur whereby people are contending over availability of space. Um, I see also on a regular basis, weekly or monthly, some very large requests coming in from specific maritime sectors, not just crews, it might be yachting, super yachts, that ask for a lot of bandwidth that, that we struggle to try and put our heads around and say, how do we provide that? So I think, you know, this, this need and desire for more bandwidth will continue. We see it today. 
I think people at times are prepared to pay either the same or more if they see what they're getting back in return is really delivering for them. Um, it's not just a, a race to the bottom all the time. Um, and I think I think it was PJ that mentioned it. Uh, there was one word, and, and, and it resonates with me, flexibility. And, and that is tied to now where we look at CapEx, because the, the conundrum is, you know, if we want to get over the barrier of cost of ownership of VSAT terminals and hardware, somebody's got to pay for it. Um, if it's not the customer because they don't have the cash in the bank or they want to reserve that that fund for something else, then then your service provider looks at it and says, well, can I put something together? Am I selling it? Well, actually, probably not. What we see is generally in the last few years, there's been a, a, a large desire to lease and to bundle and to package and pay a subscription fee almost, if you will, for the equipment and the applications and a set amount of bandwidth to go with it. And they're prepared then to look at a budget and say, for X amount per month, that's my spend rate, but now I want all of the elements to go to go with it. And now the service provider is looking at it and, and funding the hardware to lease over a period of time. So the conundrum is, you know, if you introduce flexibility over a term, how can you guarantee recovery of your investment in your assets that may take five or seven years to pay off? So we definitely see flexibility requests being made and, and there's a, a balance to, to be made, I think. We, we have, you know, people are prepared to look at more flexible arrangements when they offer solutions to customers they just got to be pretty sure at the end of the end of that term, they've got uh, other opportunities that come their way that they can loan the equipment to, if you will. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And, and, um, and to rebound on that, uh, Joe, uh, what's driving or key driver behind the, the, the demand for more bandwidth is applications. It's our ability to create new uh, applications that will drive more bandwidth. You were talking early on about video conferencing. Video applications, of course, are bandwidth hungry. And if I want to, to do that from my ship, uh, it's uh, it's going to uh, to require more bandwidth. But I want Absolutely. to come back one, uh, one minute to what Kenji was mentioning about control versus cost versus differentiation uh, to again emphasize how value-added services are becoming uh, critical uh, for service providers. Let's look at the evolution of uh, satellite architectures and satellite constellations architectures. What's happening with HTS, with VHTS? I'm talking geo first. Mm -hmm. Satellite operators have to invest in the ground segment and deliver megabits. Because of the architecture of the satellites, it would cost far too much for a service provider to do it himself. Plus, it can, depending how the, the satellites are built, it can significantly impact the efficiency of the satellite. Yeah. So a lot of the HTS and VHTS to come uh, will be sold on a per megabit basis. If you go to non-GEO now and you go to uh, um, uh, LEO and MEO, O3B has been selling megabits, uh, LEO constellations will be megabits. Coming back to GEO, Global Express is megabits. Singtel, I believe, is a part, an Inmarsat partner and is selling Global Express. Uh, and, and as a service provider, you don't have con control on the network. Is it a problem? Yes and no. You can certainly argue it's less differentiation. Okay? Um, and therefore, the differentiation must come more and more from other things, value-added services, and beyond value-added services as well, all the technical support, whether it's 24-7, whether it's on-the-ground support, uh, your ability to solve problems quickly, including problems that are not exactly on the satellite link, that may be on the LAN, but you have uh, quality uh, engineers that are able to solve it for your customers. So all this creates a customer experience that is differentiating, but, but it's happening. With Advance, we're trying to... Uh, while the network is, is built by UTLSAT, we're trying to put our partners in control as much as possible. 
uh, uh, Utelsat has has um, invested many millions of dollars to be to build a new OSS BSS system, with obviously a uh, a partner portal. It was developed initially for um, uh, for our Connect um, uh, satellite, and we've we've uh, added new features uh, to uh, support uh, Utelsat uh, uh, advance uh, our global uh, KU band uh, network. And really, um, uh, the objective here, in line with what I was saying earlier in terms of cloudification of, of our uh, satellite uh, sector, is um, to automate as much as possible. I've always been uh, shocked by how manual we are as, a, as an industry. Service yeah. providers, we do, we do so many things manually. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. So automate so that the partner can go into the portal, can provision a link, upgrade, downgrade, can do a lot of things himself. He can be in control. That's our aim with Utelsat Advance. So number one, flexibility. Number two, automation, putting the partner in control. So yes, you don't own the network and you can say you lose control, but I think you can regain control with the right level of automation where you have the ability to do a lot of things without having to go through a manual uh, intervention. But in any case, I think creating value through uh, the support, technical support to, to the, the end customers and, and applications, value-added services, is becoming more and more critical for service providers. So Thomas, I want to drill in on the automation theme. I, I saw a couple of reactions from your side. Um, what yes, do you think? My about language. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think, uh, so, so a couple of uh, good evolutions have helped us forward on that topic, right? I mean, um, the 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 proliferation of Leo constellations and those type of things. Uh, even the the you know the example of Google Loon with a with a handful of balloons trying to orchestrate services. Uh, gave rise to to um, the need for technology to and and more, more standardization to automate things and automate you know there's dynamic there's a recognition that resources can be dynamic you know uh, more or less uh, uh, moving uh, through the they're not flying but they're in orbit um, so dynamic resources and then there are dynamic services it's about setting up and, and tearing down services and it's not all static and we don't really want people to get manually involved. And obviously in the maritime industry, the examples that we were talking about, there's roaming, there's you know, ship routes, there is you know, beam handover and all these different things. Uh, so so um, the complexity of that and the need for automation gave rise to uh, what is called service orchestration, right? Service orchestration is kind of all encompassing uh, you know, it's automation, but it's also using dynamically using resources and, of course, recognizing that you want to do complex service provisioning at the same time. Uh, and, and you have a subscription model, and I'm happy to hear uh, Pierre-Jean talk about the OSS BSS efforts of, um, of, of uh, Utilsat. So in, in, in a certain way, what you really want is somebody to subscribe to a service, but then the service kind of gets proliferated over the network, over the satellite and, and orchestrated. So, so what we do is we use the, let's say the, the common um, infrastructure uh, and, and, and standardization on, on, on cloud service orchestration. So our central network management system will be on cloud. It will be, you know, it is service orchestrated to fit right into, you know, whatever, the dyna dynamic nature of services to be done, so that there is definitely a bright future ahead. I think in in uh, in in taking the automation very serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I think we've all kind of you know hit at this at various times, but I want to focus on flexibility and and what that means for everybody. Um, I think we've heard that kind of flexibility from Thomas means that ability to kind of you know this orchestration layer, which I think is really important, and and PJ hit it the nail on the head of. It is surprising how many manual processes exist in the satellite sector, like period, full stop. Um, I think outsiders from the other technology landscapes come in and see that we're still in the air traffic control world of moving little pieces of paper across the network. And that's how things are, are tagged and managed. 
and they're just astounded that there's not some API that you're like, do this and, and the system takes care of it. So building that world, I think is going to be a game changer um, in the world. But, you know, Joe, Kenji, I'm, I'm kind of looking at you two. Um, what does flexibility mean for you? I mean, you're kind of in this weird middle ground of, I need to buy services and I need to buy capabilities to provide things to my end users. They're asking to be for me to be more responsive to, hey, I had a bad month or I'm gonna have a bad month next month. Oil prices are down. Can I turn off my service? And then you have gotta to go to PJ and be like, hey, I need to turn off my service for a month. Like, how do you see flexibility kind of coming into your businesses? So so Joe, maybe we'll start with you. Um I think it's for us it's having choices, options. You know, if I look at flexibility, it's being flexible on the network side. That that's pretty important to us and pretty critical. Um, I think we overcome that. I mean, we've got various things in play. We we are a teleport operator. So number one, we, we've got our own regional structure that we look at um with those beams. But we're also a partner. We we partner with some of the other satellite operators. And we do so because of coverage or bandwidth or a different type of technology being required. So you have to show flexibility there um, in, in how you work with your partners, or more importantly, who you choose as your partner. You've got to get that one critically right to make sure that they actually uh, deliver what you need and, and do so with the right support. Um, but having the flexibility to scale up and down is also very important for us people wise, you know, looking at the various projects around the world, why you do things well for a customer at times is to do with proximity to your customer. And, you know, if there are certain large projects happening in one part of the world, you've got to have the local support ready for them. Uh, in that region and that's that's down to people being flexible with the people and where they sit making sure you've got the right engineers available at the right ports uh, to to go and visit the vessel and and I think that is definitely a customer requirement you know they possibly don't uh, list that at the top of the list but it's something that they they want to see when things go wrong, let's say, and support is required or things are needed at the kickoff of a, a major project, you have to you have to be flexible in that area. Uh, but I also think you've got to be flexible in, in the solutions that you offer. Um, we can't just sit on what we have. We can't stand still. We're continually looking at the market and looking at solutions and trying to see if that will help um, with customers, help with... Um, customer retention or getting new customers on board. So, you know, I think on a regular basis, we're, we're continuing to, uh, to, to try out new applications and to see if that's a, a requirement. But being flexible moving forward in the future is, is also about how we position ourselves with uh, some of the new satellite operators. And we, we need to be looking very closely at some of the, the LEO type um, operators that will be coming out and trying to understand the impact and the changes that they will have on on the network, on the landscape, on the customers. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a place for us there, I'm sure, um, to to work and be the the conduit, the person in the middle that joins the customers that we're looking after today with new technologies that are coming forward uh, tomorrow. Um, but, uh, I think for me uh, to. to... To add to what you're saying, Joe, uh, flexibility is, uh, uh, you know, I want to upgrade the bandwidth or downgrade or stop the service. It's feasible today if you have it in your contract, it's feasible over mm. a certain the time unit, so you can do it uh, one month or two months or three months per year and so on. Okay, it exists today. You have to do some paperwork or you have to, to send a, an email and request it, etc. What we're going to do with advance is that you go through the portal and you say, I want more bandwidth for a week, for a month, or for three hours, because I want to do a video conference, uh, HD, and I want more, more bandwidth. And you go through the system and you provision it 
and it's done and you don't need to talk to any, to to anyone it is much easier for satellite operator to do that than for a service provider because we have a lot of bandwidth <laughs> uh, can you can you buy can you buy as a service provider can you buy a, a few megahertz for 3 hours no it's going to be complicated Although there are, there is the OU, the OU business, uh, the occasional use business in the video world, but that's very expensive. Uh, I listen. There is. So we I want see to give that, that, that yeah. ultimate flexibility to service providers. They do it themselves. They're in control, and there's no time you need and, and limitation. You upgrade, downgrade, um, uh, as you want with ultimate flexibility. Well, listen, and to talk to that point, and why I'm happy to hear that is that you know we we see a lot of customer requirements coming through for short term projects you know whereby on maybe the one example on the offshore energy side three months projects or a six month project is a requirement you know but a lot of the older type of structures to contracts that were set up to talk to your point were done at 36 month levels or maybe at best 24 months levels so they didn't quite fit you know the square going into the round hole wasn't applying here so you know, to come up with a solution where we can meet the customer requirement is is critical if it is short term and we can do that and even better it's through a portal then fantastic because you know we we see that being absolutely a a, a frustration within our within our uh, industry and, and as you say as well, another example, maybe you do only want two or three hours for video conferencing requirements to turn up the bandwidth and turn it back down. Seeing quite a few of those requests coming in and to demonstrate that ability to have the flexibility is, is, is pretty critical. Kenji, what about on your side? Well, maybe I did, Brad, just go back on your earlier point about, you know, so much manual work which is still going on around. I think... The, the, the key is, I think we are in the satellite business, which means that we are in the rocket science business. So we spend a lot of money and time up getting equipment up there so we don't look down on the earth. So all the things on earth is just too mundane for us. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes aside. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> we have to focus up there so we don't look down on earth. Okay, just aside. So coming back to the, your, your term on flexibility, to me as an operator, flexibility means ability to adapt, ability to innovate, ability to change. And all these are very important for us as an operator because we have to try and bring the land experience, which all of us are spot actually now. Spot in terms of the speed of connectivity, the ease of connectivity, the, 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 the how I say, the, the efficiency or the throughput or whatever you, you can call it. But how do we port this beautiful experience on land we are experiencing and spot for choice onto the sea. I think for a lot of uh, land users, they do not understand that actually the sea is a totally different world. If we were to look at the sea itself, actually the sea by itself is actually a very big country. If you look at just USA itself, connectivity in a big city, like let's say New York City, is a given you can get certain things at a certain, everybody, because there are so many millions of people living there. But how do you go and bring a connectivity to somebody right in the middle of the USA, in the middle of a desert? So to bring connectivity to that from a provider, you need a regulator who comes in and say, okay, look, I'm prepared to do the funding. So similarly, I think if we look at connectivity at the sea, one guy who sails out right in the ocean near Antarctica, he goes there for one hour a year. He expects connectivity at the same level of uh, you know, price as well as uh, coverage, as well as thing from somebody who's right in the middle of a busy crossway of the maritime. So, so 
there is this element of that the sea and the experience in the sea, the sea actually is a very, very big country. So there is no one master who say, okay, look, I will subsidize somebody who is going down to Antarctica to look at the whales for two hours and then he comes back in again. So, but yeah. on the other hand, so, you know, when, once you have all this economics of who will look after all these small little remote ships who are traveling far, far away versus all those people who are concentrated in, let's say, for example, the Straits of Malacca. It's a highly congested area. So there's not enough actually bandwidth over, no matter how many operators are, everybody will consume. You throw gigs there, everybody will just consume all the capacity. So it's, it's, it's just a matter of how you ensure that you have this global connectivity. So it's an element of the cost also is very important there. Because we do, unfortunately for the maritime industry, we don't have one governing body who say, okay, look, I will have tax all those people who uses the bandwidth on this route and I will subsidize somebody who goes down to Antarctica to watch the whale itself. Yeah, yeah there's no universal service fund for the maritime Precisely. sector, right? Like that's, I mean, I think, uh, you know, IMO and crew welfare and kind of all that digitalization requirements, those are maybe prescriptive requirements, right? I mean, those are the end users are obligated to fill those needs rather than um, I'm going to enable some some transfer of, of services or capabilities, right? Or I'm going to force satellite operators or whatever connectivity providers to, you know, solve that I'm going to go to Antarctica problem. Um, and that's a, you know, yeah, hard problem to solve. I mean, maybe not in the Leo world that we're going to operate in, in, you know, five or 10 years, maybe that will be, look, those guys will get it really cheap because, hey, like the, the, the cost has already sunk for connecting those providers. But um, yes. it's, it's definitely a, a different paradigm. Um, so I think any conversation with, uh, with flexibility and about kind of satellite networks as a service and, you know, kind of the future um, is really remiss with, with maybe about talking about kind of three things. We t I think we hit on one. We talked about all the, you know, the new management layers between the satellite operators and the service providers and kind of what that means. Um, but I want to hit about two ones. We've, we've kind of danced around the Leo topic. Um, so I'm kind of curious to kind of go around the room and find out what people's thoughts about how Leo is or is not going to change the paradigm. And then the other one, and this is kind of more of a Thomas question. Um, you said you kind of envision a world where end users don't look at boxes. Um, so I'll, I'll take that very literally and mean, does that mean software defined radios? Does that mean some virtualized ground segment stuff, stuff um, kind of open standard standardization, those types of of questions. So maybe Thomas, we'll start with you and, and we'll focus on that kind of standards question and then go into Leo for everybody yeah. else. It, well, the, the, the rise of, of the architecture of Leo's and, and our, there's two, there's two drivers. You talk about Leo as a driver. I think, I think one of the drivers about Leo is that you can't really populate a whole Leo constellation and it's a glorification of its throughput. And, and it's, you know, there's a, and it's, let's connect every inch of the planet type of uh, mm -hmm. uh, promise. You can't do that without a cloud architecture behind it, right? And I mean, it's terabits, it's this, it's that. You, if you really want to do all of that, you need a cloud architecture behind it. So that's one, that's one good driver. I think the other driver simply for us is, is you know, we've been, we've been on the ground segment, we've been, we, we had the uh, Moore's law, which was like, okay, you know, uh, every 18 months we get better at it. We get better at throughput, at scale, at, at a lot of different things. Uh, and, and we can ride on, you know, what's available on the electronic side and processing power, of course. And if you, you go with that as a driver, you automatically use the cloud also as a driver for processing things and scaling things. And, 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 and like I said before, the cloud is on the ground. The cloud is part of the ground segment. Uh, it's not in space, although there are definitely are attempts to do that. Um, so, so um, this virtualization does happen uh, everywhere where it's possible, right? Our hubs get more and more virtualized. We use cloud architecture in the network management systems, in the data processing side, in you know, in the application side. 
uh, we still have many, many customers that want some kind of on-premise cloud solution, right? That where it's not fully a public cloud, which there's a difference between public cloud and on-premise. And maybe, you know, you want to end uh, in, in country, uh, you know, the, 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 the mobile network in country, or you want to end this um, enterprise network at a certain location and it's not fully AWS or in Microsoft Azure, but it can be uh, in, in, the, in the short future for sure. Um, so, so that's that's all happening and it will continue to happen where it can. Of course, when you look at Joe and he has this huge antenna um, <laughs> behind him, you, you know that not everything's virtual, right? That antenna could be in its best virtualized you know, world, it could be some kind of phased array area lying in a field and, and be used by many different <laughs> uh, you know, connectivity um, networks, but, but still it's a it's piece of hardware. Um, yes, sitting. Yeah, the ownership could be virtual, but eventually it's, it's a thing. Yeah, it could be, you know, whatever. It could, be, yeah. Yeah, it could be as virtual as, but still a piece of hardware. So yeah. there, there is a limit to, to that. On, 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 even on the terminal side, there are definitely, well, I, I can state now, all of our terminals more or less are have some kind of software defined radio, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they have multiple waveforms, they can host multiple waveforms, you can, they can change. We call it, sometimes we call that personality because we can link them to other types of networks or other types of constellations or other types of you know, use cases. So they're all more or less software defined, um, uh, but, but that will continue and that, that, that is not truly standardized or though, although it can be uh, more standardized. Um, and the architecture on the hub side is again, as much virtualized as it, it will go with the flow of being as much first virtualized as it can be. And more and more standards in terms of architecture, whether it's 5G core uh, to host, you know, different real-time processing or, or service orchestration, that's more and more standardization. SD1, how to connect to the backbone network. Nothing will be invented by satellite folks only everything's going to be more or less uh, standard. Yeah. yeah. So, so Joe, I'm kind of looking at you and, you know, you PJ walks through this portal experience, right? And I think portals are great until all of your vendors have portals and then you're kind of back in the world <laughs> that you are right now. Um, so what are you looking for of like, I, I need a portal to manage my portals? Like, how does this world work for you? Well, that wouldn't be a bad idea. Bring it here first. Yeah, a portal to manage a portal. We'll we'll see if we can do that one. Um, I I think um, for for me the what am I looking forward to? Uh, it, it's you know when we do eventually get our Leo constellations um, here. It, I, I'm interested to see what advantages we take from having the low latency that I think is one of the key significant benefits of, of that type of satellite um, constellation. We, we are looking at a world where, you know, moving forward in the future, we're talking about unmanned vehicles, unmanned uh, uh, vessels. Um, it, it's there has to be applications, one would think, that can utilize the benefits of the Leo constellation and that low latency to do things in a better way that we simply can't do today. Um, I mean, um, we see it as well. We, we have projects, an interesting project came my way a few months ago, and it was to do with uh, ROVs, remote uh, operating vehicles, that, that would go to the seabed or help with platforms in terms of looking at the uh, stabilization of the platform. And they, and they wanted to do that and control it over satellite communications. You know, it, we found a way of doing it, but it was a little bit complicated and you could always do with more bandwidth that we touched on um, previously. And the costs were quite significant, um, but there was a way of doing it. And then we had to find the right teleport to land to such that we didn't add any more latency uh, delays over that link going back to the customer premises. I, I think, you know, with that live example, we have a lot of challenges. We could have, we could just about have done it and gotten away with it. But I think that will change with a low latency type 
of, of network. So I'm, I'm looking forward just to understanding some of the benefits that we're going to see really be driven out of that when, when, when they arrive. How do you see this kind of evolving of this whole conversation of everything, of Leo, FBAs, standardization? I think the Leo would be a very good booster for the whole satellite industry because there will be a lot more money thrown into ground equipment, especially the antennas. Because I think if you look at the web articles, web SpaceX is saying that, okay, look, I'm, I'm going to have a charge, a, a terminal at only four nine nine when I produce it at $2,000 because okay. eventually maybe down the road, the production cost will come down to about four nine nine. So to bring down to the production cost four nine nine from two thousand over dollars per day, there will have because there's money thrown in because there will be volume. So there will be manufacturers or people who will come in to do R and D to try and you know look at the you know the motor or miniaturize it or shrink it or so all these will be actually good for the whole satellite industry because one of the barriers of uh entry of for that uh, matter cost is actually the antenna. Because I think there is so much, uh, you look at the mobile phone, the mobile phone used to be a two, three thousand dollars a piece. They are now to be a two, three hundred dollars a piece now after 20 years. Mm -hmm. So it's all because there's volume, the billions of a uh, mobile phone required. Yeah. So now is if now this Leo operators are all coming in and throwing some money around, maybe, and I think there will be one sufficient, maybe two, three years. There will be enough uh, incentive for more people coming in to develop better terminals, more efficient terminals. And then once this cost comes down, everything else can evolve around that. PJ, I guess. Yeah. Try to uh, well, up the uh, first of all, UTLSAT has acquired 24% of OneWeb. Yeah. As you probably heard, so of course uh, we believe in uh, in Leo. Uh, it's very it's very clear to me that in a number of uh, enterprise markets, vertical markets, uh, Leo will make a big difference. It's driven by different factors. Maybe an obvious one is the move to the cloud. Enterprises are moving a lot to the cloud. Well, the cloud requires lower latency. Um, uh, remote operations in the oil and gas sector, more and more people onshore, fewer people offshore, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Leo will will bring a, a lot of value in a number of these of these markets, and and uh, it's important for Utilsat to have a to have a play in um, uh, in Leo. But what's uh, what's clear as well with Leo is that it will further. Uh, accelerate, emphasize the move uh, of satellite operators towards services, towards delivering megabits. Because on, on Leo Constellation, you are not going to buy megahertz. As a service provider, you will be buying megabits. Um, so it comes back to what was mentioned earlier, the need for service providers to create really create value uh, further down the value chain with uh, support, uh, value-added services, et cetera. But what's very important in this um, in this evolution of the value chain is that there are operators like Utelsat who have clearly decided that um, they want a partner to integrate the Utelsat services together with other elements of the solution, and that partner to sell it to the end customer. Okay. That's very clearly our go-to market strategy. There are other operators that are taking a different that are taking a different route, Leo or non-Leo or Geo, uh, and are saying we want to go direct to the end user. Intelsat in a, in uh, aviation, commercial aviation, with the acquisition of GoGo to start with, but you can imagine uh, it may be replicated in other markets. Viasat with the acquisition of Ringnet, going into oil and gas um, to start with. Uh, and some and some maritime offshore vessels, etc. Uh, SES has been going direct in cruise for some years. More recently, in shipping with Maersk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there will be different strategies, 
But some operators are clearly going very far down the value chain direct to the end customer. Uh, others uh, believe in the ability of partners to create a lot of value for the end customers and that that role is very important. And that's uh, Utelsat's uh, position uh, very clearly. Yeah, no. So I want to thank everybody. It's been a really great, great session. Um, I think we, t- we had a lot of points and I think the, the overarching theme is that the serviceification, I don't know, that's not even a word, but uh, whatever as a service is a model that is proliferating across the value chain for satellite services. Um, we have a ground segment where we're seeing that, that coming through of the scalability of eventually there's, there's hardware, but the capability of that hardware to scale across services is, is changing dramatically. Um, on the space segment side, that's becoming much more flexible and much more capable, um, both in terms of the actual physical hardware. Of, like Kenji said that we focus a lot on this stuff in space, and we've I think we've invested a lot of that flexibility on orbit, and now we're bringing that down to the ground. And in, in terms of ways that businesses can ingest that and respond, um, and Joe and, and PJ and everybody, I think you've really hit the nail on the head that businesses and customers of all all of our customers are really looking for being able to build flexible services and respond to their needs in a much more quicker manner, right? Whether or not that's, they pick up the phone and you have you send somebody there in an hour to, I need that three hours of bandwidth because I have a really important video call or I'm doing something. Um, so thank you everybody for for having, having taken some time out of your day uh, to being with us. And I'll, I'll turn it back over to the APSCC folks to close out the session. Thank you very much for that, Brad. Thank you, PJ. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Thomas and and Kengi. Really appreciate your insights and participation in today's panel. Thank you most of all to Utilsat for their support for today's session and for the APSCC webinar series. If you're interested in looking into sponsoring one of our webinars, uh, please do get in touch with us at info at apscc.or.kr. Likewise, if you want to see about upcoming webinars, check out APSCCSAT.com, APSCCSAT.com. Uh, should be the landing page that you've already registered on and where you should be watching this, this webinar. It shouldn't be too hard to find. Uh, if you just look at upcoming uh, webinars, uh, you should have a, a good look at the schedule, uh, a good idea of what we've got in store for you. Uh, coming up next week, Innovation Showcase. We'll be looking at a series of companies that are doing interesting things in the new space area. So please do join us. Uh, for that showcase. We look forward to seeing you again soon.